shut the waters I can't see Your clear waves lapping at my feet The lifeless ocean, black not blue I didn't help but deep down I knew In shallow waters I used to see Dolphins playing in front of me The seaweed swaying, keeping time Tidal rhythms, laugh not cry Oh, 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 oh Why do tears fall from the sky? Oh, oh, oh We give in a please tell me why Remember the salty ocean breeze Used to burn castles on the beach Splashing around in the summer heat Now it's just oil up to our knees Bring back the days we used to care When all of these troubles were not there Cry for help, this is my song If we do nothing, it'll all be gone In here in Calhoun County and maybe the worst oil spill ever in the Midwest. You've heard all of the 2012 hype, a pending apocalypse predicted by sources from Mayans to Nostradamus. But are you worried for the end of the world? What if we told you there was something more likely to occur that you really should be worried about? A huge slick, about 877,000 gallons of oil. This is why we have to stop Ambridge and these oil companies. Join us as we uncover a pending disaster that you don't want to be in the dark about. This time on Disaster Pending, we unearth an alarming issue that deserves serious attention. Would you want to be drinking this? Can I smell that? The Keystone XL Pipeline is a controversial 1,700 mile oil pipeline that will stretch from Canada to Texas. The Keystone XL project is a 1,700 mile pipeline from Hardesty, Alberta to Port Arthur, Texas that crosses six different states with the intention of, of transporting under pressure and heat a diluted bitumen uh, that could be uh, processed into oil, uh, products like gasoline or diesel. And it's a pipeline that will carry up to 900,000 barrels of oil. There's oil 
all being reported down in that area. Obviously, wildlife has been affected. The pipeline carries with it the possibility of spilling extremely toxic oil into one of nature's most vast resources of fresh water on U.S. soil. You could have uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 190,000 gallons of oil that would spill into the underground aquifer if there were a, a subsurface break of this pipeline. Ultimately, whether it spills into the water or gets into our food or we burn it and it gets into our air, it's still just a uh, a nasty source of energy, a, a dirty source of energy. And there's lots of other alternatives out there, wind and solar and numerous other uh, renewables, which are clean, renewable, and free. Today, a House Energy and Commerce subcommittee held a hearing on pipeline safety. We don't know exactly what happened. It's really just a matter of uh, when our Congress and our president are determining policy whether they want to put their backing behind a, a known but dirty energy source versus starting to put them into renewable and clean energy sources. Tar sand oil is the most corrosive and toxic form of oil that has ever been known to man. It is also the most energy intensive form to extract from the earth. It's it's effectively you know oil uh, like you you have in so many other places uh, except up in, in there and in other places in the world it's the tar sands is where the oil is just embedded in in sand in, in much heavier uh, heavier soil than you might have in the ocean or, or underground and so it's it's harder to get out and it's uh, it's because it's harder to get out there's more refining more chemicals more um, of the nasty things that are needed to to get it out. To get that oil out of the sand, um, there's different processes. When the oil is close to the surface, they mine it like an open pit mine. When it's deeper down, they have in situ or underground processes that include steaming it out. They sent huge trucks, three stories tall, out into the out into a huge strip mined uh, area where the pits will go down three, four hundred feet, and giant uh, extractors will uh, with huge Huge barrels, scoop it up, drop the oil, the uh, the dirt into the trucks that then will take it, and they will dump it in a centrifuge, and then they collect that oil. They take the the toxic kind of effluent that's left, the dirty water, and they they put that into a, a big huge tailing pond, uh, which now uh, cover about 50 square miles in Alberta. You can see them from outer space. I'm, I'm told that there's very toxic chemicals in this oil. Folks in the area should be very careful if they're, you know, nearby and approaching it, coming here to look at it. The second way they extract it, where they'll actually run pipes down into the soil that they that are perforated, and they run hot steam to melt the bitumen. They'll they'll then pump the oil out from those pipes. So you you have less clear cutting, and you don't have the the big pits but you use much more energy as it turns out they're much more carbon intense. Pro Pipeline Canadians see the process a little differently. All of them uh, are subject to very strict environmental rules. Canada has the, the strictest environmental regime in the world for oil companies, uh, even stricter than in the United States, believe it or not. So all the open pit mines have to be totally reclaimed. 61 square kilometers have already been reclaimed and replanted. One of the large oil and sands companies called uh, Syncrude has planted more than five and a half million trees. Extracting tar sands has resulted in countless communities dependent on groundwater supplies to suffer from contaminated resources. Though the health effects documented in areas of tar sand extraction are continuously dismissed. There was a recent study by a professor at the University of Alberta that found 13 different substances in the Athabasca River. Seven of them were at levels above what the EPA would consider to be safe uh, in the United States. They've tested our well here. They said it's fine. Well, I'm here to tell you I haven't drank a drop of water out of that well since the oil spill happened. They can smell the oil. And I was concerned for my daughter. I, I had no idea what was going on. See, I knew she was by the river. I know I'm bleeding eternally, and I know it's from the oil spill. They pray.
practically live at the doctor. Meanwhile, the government of Canada and Alberta continued to deny that the, even that the, these toxic chemicals were reaching these communities and refused to really explore the causal link between sudden occurrence of cancer, which everybody acknowledged except the government, was dramatically higher than it ever had been prior to the production of tar sands upriver. Ezra Levant, a conservative political analyst based in Toronto, is an active supporter of the Keystone XL pipeline. Until we invent some fantasy fuel of the future, uh, like the lithium crystals or, or whatever, you know, whatever that science fiction future is, I look forward to that discovery. But until that happy day comes, we're stuck driving cars or flying planes with jet fuel until that new fuel is invented. So we've got to be grown up about it. We've got to be morally serious. The alternative is not oil sands oil versus this fantasy fuel of the future. It's oil sands oil versus oil that comes from other places. And right now the United States buys oil from all its enemies. Rising gas Gas prices, terrorism threats, and U.S. energy security are among the many reasons backing the pipeline. In a jeopardized economy, we can't afford to lose any potential jobs that could aid in American livelihood. These are real jobs. These are serious working jobs to build that pipeline right now. And it seems to me that that's a no-brainer, even if it was just one new job. But what about when it comes down to one life? Is the pipeline worth the claimed jobs and energy security? And the diseases are things like lymphoma, uh, rare bile duct cancers, and all of these are associated with the compounds that you find in tar sands. You start off with tar and benzene, and you take drinking water. It's it's people can can figure out their own worst case. The companies actually can get away with murder and almost literally get away with murder. Well, now I have about 200 sick people. They're cancer. People are dying. And you have a choice. What they did is illegal and wrong to cover up oil. This week marks the end of a summer of fossil fiascos. In this recession, no job creation can be spared. A Chevron pipeline burst near Salt Lake City. I am here only to protect my community. Unemployment rates are at record highs. Because there will be a spill someday and they will lie to you. Spilling over 20,000 gallons of crude into a creek that feeds the Great Salt Lake. And the economy needs jobs to ensure the stability of the everyday American. All kinds of other equipment trying to suck up this oil, but wildlife and people's houses. We're at actually someone's house right now and they're affected by it. The Keystone XL pipeline is supported by a variety of groups, from Canadian politicians to American unions, and has promised to bring up to 20,000 jobs in its lifetime. The first claim is that it's going to actually create jobs. Those claims are wildly inflated, and the oil industry is notorious for exaggerating these claims. The, the number that I tend to use myself is 20,000 jobs, but even if it's only 20 jobs, great, that's 20 more jobs than we have now. I, I know it's more than that because you have to build that pipe, and these are good, shovel-ready jobs. However, what's overlooked is the permanence of those jobs and how exactly they will impact the economy. We, we estimate that uh, in all likelihood there'll be between 20 and 50 full-time permanent jobs from this, from this because a pipeline essentially runs itself until you have a spill. A pipeline owned by Enbridge ruptured near Marshall, Michigan, spewing nearly one million gallons of crude oil. A PG&E natural gas pipeline exploded in the San Francisco suburb of San Bruno. There's one benefit to keeping people employed, but I think there's another, another conversation that needs to be had just around our use of energy and do we want to continue to use energy that we have to extract from some pretty nasty areas of the world and, and nasty chemicals uh, used to refine those or do we want to look at chain swapping over two energy sources that are clean, renewable and free. Gas prices affect Americans every day 
and the sticker shock at the pump has sparked a pro-pipeline argument among Americans. The way Americans see it, more oil means lower prices. I don't think that's the, the big reason to get the Keystone XL pipeline. In fact, if in the end oil price, uh, gasoline prices at the pump didn't change at all, it wouldn't surprise me. The reason to bring Canadian oil down is not for cheaper gas at the pumps. It's for American jobs to build the pipeline. It's for security of supply. The whole purpose of the pipeline is to get rid of that glut to get the oil out of the Midwest down to Port Arthur where it can be processed and exported and in the process, equalize the demand and supply and raise the prices. Estimates are about 20 cents per gallon increased uh, prices for gasoline. Knowing the lack of changes that the pipeline will have on the U.S. economy, one thing to consider is U.S. energy security. It's not going to make Americans drive more or burn more oil. It's just going to replace that foreign conflict oil from Venezuela with Canadian oil sands oil that I call ethical oil. Every barrel of oil that America buys from Canada is a barrel of oil you're not buying from your OPEC enemies. But as ever advancing technologies present more and more ways to avoid using oil in the first place, is the risk worth it? To the residents of Kalamazoo, Michigan, absolutely not. July 25th, 2010, catastrophe strikes. The country watched with horror yet another Enbridge oil pipeline burst near Chicago, spilling over 250,000 gallons of crude. In Kalamazoo, Michigan, a pipeline carrying diluted bitumen from Canadian tar sands ruptured, spilling over a million gallons of the toxic substance that will be carried by the pipeline into a local creek. The creek runs into the Kalamazoo River, and the river ultimately reaches Lake Michigan. The day we learned about the oil spill, you know, we were all concerned, and I was concerned for my daughter because I knew she was by the river. I had everybody come outside, and we went to the river because it stunk really, really bad, and it looked foggy, and it smelled real bad. Because it looked funny, I guess it looked different to them. It, it wasn't how it's supposed to look. You would just see giant black oil sticks all the way down. They're playing like they dropped a can of oil like we put in our car. I actually had inhaled uh, the fumes from this oil. They came up here, Cheryl was crying. It wasn't good. And we're talking about hundreds and thousands of gallons of oil. We started getting more information in regards to how large and how great this issue was. Find out the lasting effects of this toxic spill on these unsuspecting residents just after the break. This pipeline is owned by a company called Enbridge Energy Partners. And we obviously the huge problem right now is 16 miles of affected area, 877,000 gallons of oil spilling into the Kalamazoo River. Getting reports now that there is oil down in the area of Battle Creek by a boat slip at Fort Custer Park there where they have boat slips there. There's oil being reported down in that area. The 30-inch oil pipe that ruptured and started spilling this oil out. Since the spill, Enbridge, the oil company responsible for the pipeline, has committed to doing everything possible to ensure the safety of residents. So I don't see uh, how they're protecting us. We didn't get our 1,000-foot mandatory evacuation. I was never evacuated. I didn't leave my home until I first heard New to 3 talking about it. And in fact, they just declared a state of emergency here in Calhoun County. I heard they were handing out air filters. As more reports came in later that day on TV, you know, it just, you know, it was just hard to judge whether it was that dangerous or it was just a minor thing. We're getting reports now that there is oil down in the area of Battle Creek. And I, the thing that makes me angry is that they lied to us. Our son, who has been healthy his whole life, started having headaches. That's their attitude, you know, that everything can be bought and uh, there's a price on, on everything and there's, you can't put a price on everything. We are still cleaning up the river. There remains um, a fair amount of submerged oil. Uh, we hope 
uh, to be able to have all of the submerged oil cleaned up by summer. The whole community has been affected by the contamination in more ways than one. The environment, public health, and wildlife have all been victimized by the spill. You could smell that oil in this entire town. You didn't even have to be near the river. We used to have beaver, muskrat, mink, I mean, foxes, uh, great horned owls, and it's all gone. It's, it's, they've packed up and, and moved on out and went to safer places. But when this happened, I started having seizures, and I had never had a seizure in my entire life. It, it's not a coincidence that a lot of different people are having all the same symptoms. John Bullenbaugh, a whistleblower previously working for an environmental company helping clean the spill, quickly realized that cleanup efforts were not up to par. Being asked to cover up the toxic substance was the first red flag. We had a meeting afterwards and our supervisor said if it bothered our conscience, we didn't have to bury oil. And so, I mean, at the same time he's saying we didn't have to, he's telling us if it's okay with your conscience, go ahead. And it was all, it was all to make money. He now dedicates his life to exposing the cover-up and seeks to get the help the town deserves. So what I'm going to show you is if I put my rake in here, oil is going to pop up. As you see, you don't see no oil, you just see a lot of sheen. But I'm going to rake this around. It takes about four or five minutes to pop up. And I'll show you the oil that comes up. We'll just let this sit for a minute. And... I'll stick my glove in there and I'll show you the oil that's still in here. So I just come through with this clean glove and I start grabbing this chunks of oil. You take more mud, you put on it, and only the oil sticks. That's how you can prove it's oil. And it's sticky. I would not want my kid just walking back here and get, I mean, if they swallow some of this thinking, oh, what's this, and put it in their mouth, it's, that's permanent damage for the rest of their life. To this day, tar sand oil can still be found on the banks of the river, as well as floating down the once untouched waterway. Despite the overwhelming evidence of the presence of oil, the EPA plans to open parts of the river for public use. Um, however, um, we're optimistic that uh, as early as the spring we'll be able to reopen at least a segment of the river. But they've affected everybody from homes to businesses to the people to the wildlife to everything in this community. Why are they going to open up this river? And if they do, let their grandchildren and their grandmothers and all their family be the first ones to fish and eat out of it and I want to see them do it. There's so much testing that still has to be done. It's just, it's beyond my belief. I don't know the particulars of these people in Kalamazoo Mission. Uh, I'm not saying that there aren't accidents. I know there, I know there are, there were, and there always will be. This uh, very important hearing on uh, pipeline uh, safety, oversight, and legislation. The move came after a pipeline burst in Michigan this summer, dumping almost 900,000 gallons of oil into area creeks and rivers. Uh, there is an ethical way to handle an accident. Uh, focus on cleanup and remediation, transparency. If there is some uh, malfeasance, have a trial. They've tested our well here. They said it's fine. Well, I'm here to tell you I haven't drank a drop of water out of that well since the oil spill happened. The Kalamazoo tragedy that has affected the lives of so many was from the contamination of one river. Find out the likelihood of a disaster such as this happening again right after the break. It'll break in the first month. We have no doubt about it. From April to August, the country watched with horror as the BP disaster unfolded, leaving 11 workers dead and spilling nearly 5 million barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. The nature of the Ogallala Aquifer has made it become one of the most dependent upon sources of the Midwest. Without it, say goodbye to the agricultural breadbasket of the United States. Not to mention the livelihood and health of communities. The Ogallala Aquifer stretches across eight states from the Texas Panhandle northward to South Dakota.
It is the largest single water bearing unit in North America, covering 174,000 square miles. So the chances of this pipeline leaking are really great. Uh, TransCanada, who built the pipeline, originally was not in the oil pipeline business. They built natural gas pipelines. So the Keystone One was really one of the first ones they ever built to transport oil. Uh, it also crosses over several hundred different waterways. In Texas alone, it'll cross over 640 different bodies of water. And when it's in the water and the, and the oil is being pumped at such high speed, under pressure, and it's heated, the pipelines tend to oscillate. They, wa they have a waving kind of action. That oscillation creates the greater possibility for breaks in the pipeline. The aquifer provides 30% of the fresh water of U.S. agriculture and is responsible in Kansas alone for $188 million of annual income. Take this dirty material, inject benzene into it, which is a known carcinogen and mutagenic compound, and transport it over this aquifer, which support, which provides drinking water to over 2 million people and 30% of the nation's agricultural land. The question on the table is, do we do this? And the main benefit is to help get this dirty energy material from one place to another to make it faster and cheaper for these, these certain companies. So do we want to put at risk all of this, this water and this natural land for the benefit of making this dirty energy faster and, and cheaper? The Keystone XL pipeline will not be the first pipeline to cross the precious Ogallala Aquifer. There are literally hundreds of thousands of miles of oil and gas and other pipelines crisscrossing the United States. So if pipelines are at risk for an attack, all of them are, because you just cannot guard every pipeline in America. A pipeline, God forbid there's an accident, you turn it off. I mean, hopefully sooner rather than later. But pipelines are the safest way in the world to transport oil. If you want the technology that is the most modern and the safest, the best way to move oil around is not by tanker ship, not by rail car, not by truck, it's by pipeline. By carrying so much oil, 900,000 barrels a day, to the coast, it opens up probably one of the greatest threats to uh, climate change in North America. We've learned that the U.S. has a very low chance of benefiting economically from this pipeline. Jobs are minimal and our price of oil will not decrease. The final piece of support for the pipeline is American energy security. We're led to believe that what it really does is secures our energy future. But what it really does is it retards our transition to a clean energy future. In evidence prepared for TransCanada regarding the Keystone XL pipeline application, already in place are shipper commitments guaranteeing exportation of 380,000 barrels per day. One name that continues to be brought up regarding exportation is China. What American refineries do with the oil at the end of the day, I don't care. I believe in the free market. I'm, I'm quite sure that there are many thirsty Canadian, that's where American gas stations would like to buy it, but at the end of the day, what those refineries do with it is not my concern. If the oil is going elsewhere, minimal and temporary jobs are expected, and we're not reducing the price at the pump. Are destroyed communities and the risk of toxic contamination worth it? Tell you what, I'd rather deal with a wind turbine disaster than an oil spill disaster. To have powering our lives, we really need to look at that bigger question of where that energy source is coming from, will it be there always, and is it is it harmful to us or helpful to us in the long run? The oil spill here, as you can tell, it's it's horrific. It's it's ongoing and it's going to affect generations upon generations here. It's plain and simple. The United States is at a crossroads. Most of the oil that's now available to us in the future, it's very dangerous to get this oil. We either have to go out and uh, into the really deep water like the BP horizon, or we have to destroy huge swaths of environment. So Americans can choose to go down that road 
or we can go down a different road and the different road is one where we get out of our cars or if we have to have a car it's an electric vehicle it's a hybrid it's a it's a car that gets 75 miles per gallon that's a road that actually frees us from the pump and increases the potential that our gas tank is really on our roof uh, it makes a lot of sense I think from an economic point of view there are hundreds of thousands more jobs down that route than there are continuing to make oil companies rich Your clear waves slapping at my feet